Good evening and welcome to the final event of our three-part Friends Forum series on amplifying Black narratives, the creation of Black narratives. I'm Lisa German, the University Librarian and Dean of Libraries for the University of Minnesota. The University Libraries is a proud partner with our Friends of the University Libraries in presenting this Friends Forum, a series for curious minds. The Friends Forum showcases experts speaking about topics relevant to our community. For the libraries, the exchange of ideas during events like this one is so important to developing connections with our communities. And I'm delighted that each of you are attending. The University Libraries has 12 locations in the Twin Cities that attract more than 1.6 million visitors annually to access our books, electronic holdings, archives, and special collections. At the libraries, we're striving to improve the inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility of our collections. Our goal is to support not only our University of Minnesota community, but also our wider community with meaningful resources. This evening, we will learn about nurturing the creation of Black narratives we will hear from Black authors and leaders who bring their special insights to their work. Diverse in experiences, ages, and the circles in which they move, they come together in fueling creativity, finding intriguing Black narratives, and encouraging voices in the Black community to be heard. As we in the library strive for better representation, of all of our communities, we are enthusiastic about hearing from this group of creators. Some of them have won awards for their important and impactful work, and each of them offer a different perspective. We are so grateful to them for sharing their thoughts with us. Now I'd like to share a acknowledgement that is relevant and important to all of us. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs to increase access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items. Please use the chat button if you have technical questions and the Q&A button if you have questions for our panelists. You may submit your questions at any time. We'll get to as many as possible after the discussion. So thank you. And now we will hear from Dara Beavis, author of The Indie Author Revolution and our moderator for this evening. Hey everybody. Um, first, I wanted to start by saying thank you to the University of Minnesota Libraries and uh, the Friends of Libraries for organizing this panel. I am so excited y'all for this opportunity to discuss black storytelling and the creation of black narratives. Um, I wish we had um, all the way through the weekend to just do this conversation all together, all of us. Um, thank you to you for being with us today. And before we dive in, I wanna make sure that if you were expecting to see the fabulous Crown Shepherd on our panel today, she is unfortunately able to join us tonight, but in her place, we have the incredible Shaletta Brundage, and I'm so excited for her. Um, we also have the fabulous Larry McKenzie and Sagara Shahid. Um, so let's let's dive in, y'all. Um, for my part, I just want to talk a little bit about who I am, what I do. Um, as it was stated, I own uh, Wyzink Creative Publishing, um, and I'm also the co-founder, co-CEO. Wyzink is a publisher that seeks to um, center healers. We center activists, we center messengers, we center thought leaders. We also center young writers. We publish um, a nice selection of youth anthologies. Um, and hopefully I have a chance to talk about one that I'm particularly excited about that has to do with black storytelling. Um, 
I'm also a writer and I have most recently published a picture book series for black girls. The first in that series is about Queen Amina Azaria, uh, the warrior queen. If you don't know much about Queen Amina, um, Google her, she is amazing, she is fabulous. Um, she like many black women helped to shape, uh, helped to shape civilization. Um, so, okay, what we know for sure is that history tells us that our stories as black storytellers um, aren't as important um, and that we should expect not to be centered. Um, today's panelists have made it their business to tell black stories, to center blackness and to unapologetically reshape black narratives. Um, they have various backgrounds and they come at storytelling from different angles, which is why we are in for such a treat today. Our first panelist is Shaletta Brundage, and I'm going to uh, let her take it from here to introduce herself. Thank you so much, lady, um, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Shaletta Brundage. I am the founder of ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com, a podcasting platform that celebrates Black culture and creativity. Um, I came to Minnesota back in 2004. That was my first tour of duty. Uh, left and came back in 2010. Um, and when I got here, um, I got a job at CCO Radio. Um, I started as an overnight weekend producer. Uh, was so excited to get my foot in the door at this historic station, a legacy station, been in this community almost a hundred years. And so I was just so excited to be a part of uh, the legacy of the station and they're known as a good neighbor. And I thought, yes, I'm going to get my foot in the door. I'm going to work overnight. I'm going to work my way up. And, you know, when they find out how fabulous I am, I'll be the morning show host. I'm going to be the face of the franchise. And I looked around one day and realized, hmm, in 97 years, they had never had uh, African-American female in a prime time spot. Black and brown people had always at this good neighbor station been relegated to nights and weekends. So I thought, well, surely they just have not met me yet because when they realize how fabulous I am, I will be the first uh, African-American person in prime time on CCO radio. And so I began to apply for position after position after position. And I kept getting turned down for one reason or another, only to watch uh, my white male counterparts who, you know, a couple of them didn't have as much experience as me be promoted and given an opportunity when I didn't get a shot. So I remember it was 2019, Tyler Perry was at the BET Awards. And he said, instead of fighting for a seat at the table, you've got to build your own. And I looked around at my kids and I thought, you know, in order for me to feed these four little babies, I got to have my own money. I got to decide what my worth and my value is. Uh, they ain't getting no smaller and they like snacks. So I stepped out on faith with about $47 in my pocket and I created ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. My podcasting platform, my production company, um, the vision that God gave me when I was watching Tyler Perry at those BET Awards, um, building my own table, not just for myself, but for black thought leaders uh, throughout the Twin Cities. You know, this was just supposed to be for me. This is supposed to be Shaletta makes me laugh. I'm Shaletta. That's all I had planned to do was a podcast for Shaletta. And then I heard from Dr. Verna Price. TED Talk extraordinaire, best-selling author, human potential expert. And she said, you know, Miss Shaletta, I've been trying to get on TV. I've been trying to get on the radio. I've been trying to get my message out. I want to do a podcast on your platform. And then I heard from Minneapolis counselor, Jason Clopton. He said, you know, I've been speaking to teens and I've really been trying to get the message out there about black mental health and young people. I want to do a podcast. Then three sisters came to me and said, we want to do a travel show. And before you knew it, I had a network of eight shows uh, celebrating black culture and creativity, not just the bad things, not just when somebody dies, but we show up uh, when good things happen. We talk about concerns other than police violence and crime. Uh, we talk about uh, what is happening to people who look like us and what they're most concerned about on a daily basis. Um, and you know what? We're concerned about the next generation of leaders, the next generation of broadcasters. So I brought my kids in, 
My son, Andrew, uh, is with me by my side on the podcast and platform. My two children who have autism, who a couple of years ago couldn't even talk. Now they got a podcast called Simply Autastic Siblings. Can you believe that? And we are celebrating uh, Black culture, Black creativity, and doing the damn thing like nobody else in town. And so, you know, these kids going to school, doing their thing. I'm doing my mom thing. I'm doing my business lady thing. And my daughter comes home from work one day, from school one day, and she says, Mom, I want to have uh, white skin. And I said, okay, where'd this come from? Well, she's reading me this book, and there are no black characters. And so I march down to the library, and I'm ready to cuss somebody out because they don't have a book about a little black girl with autism that my baby can read. The librarian tells me, you would have a better time finding a book about a truck or a big red dog or a purple dinosaur before you find a book about a little black girl with autism. So instead of fighting and cussing and fussing, I just wrote one. And Cameron Goes to School quickly became a bestseller um, on Amazon. It is sold in major retailers and regional grocery stores um, across the Midwest. And it is about a little black girl who nonverbal was brave enough to go to school. And it shows that it's not just little white boys who have autism. You know, my daughter was disciplined in school uh, before she was diagnosed um, with having autism spectrum disorders. Uh, she was labeled um, everything except a special needs student. And so I wrote this book to change the narrative about what kids with autism look like. And I heard from so many parents and so many educators who are using Cameron's story, using Cameron's journey um, to educate themselves and others about autism spectrum disorder. And since I made so much money and I got more kids with autism, I wrote another book. Uh, Daniel Finds His Voice came out this April for Autism Awareness Month and it quickly um, became a bestseller. A lot of people know Daniel's story. He's my youngest child. He was four and a half years old, um, nonverbal. I thought he would never talk. Um, he hadn't said two words his entire life, did not understand simple commands. I would tell this boy that I loved him and he had no idea what I was saying. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to live with me forever. He's going to always be in the pamper. He's going to always be eating puree food. He never going to find a wife or go to college. All the dreams that I had for my son um, are gone. And then one day at four and a half years old, he came up to me and started singing Old Town Road. Hot damn. That was it. Music is the way that we reach this child. And so I wrote a book about how music inspired and taught him how to find his voice. And so many parents who have nonverbal kids read this book, identify with our story. And that one became a bestseller, too. Um, so, uh, you know, so I've been speaking to parents and music educators and teachers and therapists about using music, using songs, using the stories in those songs um, to educate children, especially our African-American children. And, you know, this year I have planned on writing another book. Um, I've got four kids. And if you have more than one child, you already know you can't do something for one child without doing something for the other kids. Otherwise, they get mad and they think you're playing favorites, which as a parent, you do play favorites, but you don't want them to know you're playing favorites. So you got to, you know, do for one what you do for the other ones. And so um, I was going to write a story about my son, Brandon. And then I looked at the climate of what is happening in our country right now. And there is a large population of people who do not want to see little black boys and girls on the cover of books. And so I had to wonder, how, do I want that fight? You know, I'm on the front lines fighting for social justice. I, I'm on the front lines fighting for um, diverse media. I'm on uh, the front lines fighting these corporations to make sure they support black owned media outlets. Um, I'm on the fight for autism awareness. Do I really wanna fight these people about my book? Do I have it in me? And the answer is no. So instead of putting out a book about a beautiful black boy um, who loves art, and even though he is nonverbal, he speaks through pictures, I'm going to sit on that story. I have been sidelined by the culture and the climate in this country. And there are many African-American authors 
um, who feel the same way, who have stories to tell, but they're waiting. Not that they're scared or afraid, but we're tired. We're tired, we're beat up. We don't have the energy for another fight. And hopefully um, next year this time, uh, we'll live in a country where people um, have seen the error of their ways, who understand the importance of African-American storytellers and stories and appreciate books that have us on the cover. Now, if y'all think I'm inspiring with my sensational story, y'all ain't heard nothing yet because Coach Larry McKenzie is up next and he is just amazing. I'm just, I'm taking notes. It's like I'm not even here. I'm just going to sit back and listen because he is going to break it all the way down for us. Well, thank you, Saletta. I don't know. That's a very, very hard act to, to follow um, and really, really inspiring in terms of what you're doing. So, let me quickly just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Larry McKenzie. Most of the people, if you're watching, you uh, most people that know me, they just simply call me coach. Um, I'm a educator, author, uh, coach, and speaker. I've been a, a fairly successful high school coach here in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, spent nine years at Minneapolis Patrick Henry, um, where I won four, became the first coach in Minnesota state history to win four consecutive state titles. Uh, I would go on and spend some time, uh, a year coaching minor league professional uh, basketball, where I would win a uh, minor league professional title with the Minnesota Ripneys, uh, return to Holy Angels. And I spent the last years at uh, Minneapolis North High School. Uh, my work and mission have been around basketball. And my personal mission statement is to use the game of basketball to help young men and women become champions, first and foremost, in the classroom, in their community, in their families, and then on the hardwood. Uh, I've been blessed to become the first uh, African-American coach to go into the Minnesota Basketball Coaches Hall of Fame. Uh, in 2018, I became a Bush Fellow. In 2019, I was recognized by the National Association of Basketball coaching as a guardian of the game around education. Um, in 2019, I was also recognized by the NCAA as a living legend. Uh, and so basketball has been my way of communicating and telling my story. And so one of the things that I did, I've always been a writer since I was 14, but my first book was basketball so much more than just a game. And it was an opportunity to communicate with young people and parents about the life lessons that I've learned from basketball. So we talk about the B of being a business, the A of learning to appreciate the people in your life, S, the importance of being a student athlete, K, knowledge equal power, E, enjoy the moment, T, being teachable, B, believing in yourself, uh, your attitude determine your altitude, learning to live and living to love. Um, and I'm now working on my second project called 365 Days of Hope. Uh, had so many people reaching out to me during the pandemic, uh, loving the motivational quotes that I post on a daily basis. And as Saletta has already said, I mean, one of the things that I strongly believe in that if we don't tell our story, then who will? And all too often, uh, in my lifetime, uh, you know, we've been waiting for somebody else to come to the rescue. So I, I think having the opportunity to uh, not only for me, not only telling the story through my writings, but when I get an opportunity to share with young people on the stage through my speaking uh, as well. And just remembering that we as African people, that is the way and the history of us telling our stories. So a little bit about me, excited to be here tonight, to be a part of this great panel. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Shakira. Shakira, did I say that right? It's close, I really appreciate you. Um, uh, yes, Shakira and Larry, it really touched my heart what you um, spoke on because I like, 
I'm also directly um, here because of the support of my mentors and and then helping me and stuff like that too. So the work that you're doing in the community just reminds me of like how I position it in this space. Uh, but yeah, my name is Sagira Shahid. I'm a Black Muslim poet, a writer and performance artist um, and arts educator. Um, I use my art primarily to um, amplify my the voices and different stories in my community. Um, there aren't a ton, or there wasn't when I was growing up, I grew up in the 90s, a ton of stories that were positive that well, feature Muslim people just doing normal stuff. It was like we were villains or we were like this like, you know, sidebar, unless um, it was like, a, I guess Malcolm X is like in um, Muhammad Ali are the exceptions to that, right? So I really wanted to, in my own writing, like explore, explore um, storytelling that way. Um, and I also, in my work in the community, try to amplify other people's stories in the community, especially Black youth. Uh, two examples of that is uh, with a program that I'm a part of, a writer or mentor with called Unrestricted Interest. Unrestricted Interest actually works with students who are neurodiverse uh, and on the autism spectrum and a lot of my students are black and it's so powerful because the idea is we're supporting these youth and some of them are young adults as well and writing their own stories and publishing their work as well and so Shaletta when you were talking about your kids publishing that work and looking for stuff I was like I got some poems by some neurodiverse students that your your, your children need to vibe with and they're all uh, the folks that I work with in particular you know they're still in high school and middle school writing and publishing this work and telling their own stories um, and centering um, whatever it is in their hearts and in, in their lives and so it's really powerful. Uh, I also another example of how I work in the community to also support youth and the creative writing of our community is with a program now that uh, it was recently launched by Minnesota State Colleges, um, especially the community colleges and strengthening the pipeline of creative writers and community colleges. So it's called Write Like Us. Um, it's a we're this is the first year of the program and so we're just starting as mentors to support the creative writing um, by black indigenous and people of color uh, writers that attend community colleges across Minnesota and we're going to work for the whole year with mentoring them and supporting their goals creatively. So because I'm a creative person uh, and a poet I'm just going to share a poem um, uh, to uh, that speaks a little bit more about my work. It's called Invisibility. In the movies, my mother is always rescuing someone. My aunties are the lookouts. They pull up in a rust-colored station wagon with larger than life rims that might as well be earthbound moons. In an original cut of the very first of these films, my mother was played by a light-skinned actress and a frumpy scarf who couldn't even pronounce God the way my mother did. We swapped her out for a woman closer to my mother's hue, skin like the earth's belly hijab stunting on them. She knows how to douse Arabic with our vernacular until every language inhabiting our tongue is black seed oil and shea butter and tea tree oil and Vaseline and sandal wood and emerald oud dabbed on and glossing open palms. There are so many of these movies now of nimble black Muslim women snatching bullets out of thin air with their teeth slapping the taste out of some politician's mouth and stealing on some fluffed up tyrants your uncle's big old walking stick in each one of these movies. There's a version of a scene where she resuscitates the day with some ingenious roots and juice concoction or one goes to recitation of a verse. Everyone who isn't us used to assume she didn't know because her last name is Jackson or Shabazz or she didn't have the Kimar on. Back when even our own men tried taking all the credit for our labor. When she rescues them, it's usually mid-backflip, pre-uppercut, her whole body and soul a magnificent flex. Cut to the credits crowning our names. Cut to our rippled shoulder shimmies. Cut to the previews unbinding binaries. Cut to applause and the theater surround sound playing a native Dean track or that doo-wop song, Sugar Mum, or all of SZA in the background. So uh, without further ado, I just want to invite um, Dara to the, the virtual stage. <laughs> Sagira, that was um, just healing, just to hear your words, to hear Shaletta, your story, Larry, to hear about basketball, uh, being the way in which you're able to share your life lessons. Y'all, this is going to be such a night that we will, seriously, amazing. Um, Shaletta, you talked about being sidelined and being tired. That really jumped out to me. And Larry, you're using basketball, as you said, 
to communicate life lessons and you're currently writing a book about hope that jumped out at me and Sagari, you mentioned they're not being muslim they're not being books featuring muslims doing normal things in the books that you were seeking as a young reader my first question to the three of you and why don't we start with Sagira and go back to Shaletta being the last voice we hear. Um, what has been missing from this dialogue about Black storytelling? I know of a lot of things missing for me um, and I'll throw out that I really feel like what's missing from the dialogue about Black storytelling is joy. Um, I, I wish that we spoke more about Black joy and not having our storytelling center um, all of the, the, the hard things about being a Black person. Um, so that's mine. What, what, what Sagir, I'll start with you. What's missing from the dialogue about Black storytelling? Yeah, well, I'll kind of piggyback off of the poem that I, I wrote. Yes. In the, that, um, that poem is like my desire for there to be an action hero movie featuring a Black hijabi. <laughs> like awesome um i think we just need we have this kind of happening already but we need more investment we need to really invest more seriously in the diversity of what it means to be black there's so much diversity in our experiences um people who are have disabilities people who have different class backgrounds people who come from different diasporic cultural experiences and a lot of times because of the impacts or influence of white supremacy, we kind of get pigeonholed into these really narrow like frameworks. And I think what I really love about the rising generation, especially Gen Z, is like this pushback that both social media and these content creators are, creators are doing where we can, we don't need, um, people are already taking it upon themselves to utilize social media or other platforms to share the diversity of our stories. But we need to continue that investment because there's so much that we have going on there's, and there's endless amount of things, but a lot of times there's like a couple of like kind of main stories that get focused on and we need to expand that diversity and support that diversity with some financial, um, serious financial invest investment, I think. I love what you said. There is so much. Larry, what about you? What's missing from this dialogue? So without question, I, I you, you go to resources, right? And having access to resources to be um, able to take time off of work or other things to be able to spend time writing. But one of the things that I think is missing is, you know, I always say you can't be what you don't see. And what's missing is mirrors right? So often, right? Those that do right, those that do right, who have expired and have success, so often they're not interacting with community. And so the kids that are in urban settings don't get to see the possibilities that that can be me. They don't get to see, they don't get to see our movies. And so because of that, like everything else, they their 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 thinking is that I can't do that. They're already being told in these educational settings that, I mean, you don't read good enough, you don't write good enough, you don't do you don't have what it takes to do that. So it it takes a lot. So let talked talk talked about fighting that battle. So that first battle that you got to overcome is convincing yourself that you are capable, that, that, that you're capable. And so when you don't have mirrors, when you don't have other people that you can uh, fall, I mean, like for me, I mean, an example, I decided that I want to write, but there was no one in my family that mm. I could reach out to for advice, you know, uh, uh, about uh, how, how to navigate with publishers, right? Uh, all of the stuff that goes into doing it. So I, I think to me, you know, the, the challenge is, is the mirrors are scarce. And, and again, mm -hmm. as I said, so often for, for us that, that inspire to do that, you can't be what you don't see. Coach Larry, I'm just, we're going to have to all unmute our mics. I don't like people muting the mics because I like for people to jump in. This is a real conversation. Come on, Daryl. Uh, this is a real we family, and they just eavesdropping. I'm going to sit back in my chair. We just <laughs> eavesdropping on the family conversation. And Coach Larry, let me tell you something. My Uncle Tim, my mom's only brother, 
right? When I published my first children's book, he was just overwhelmed. And we couldn't figure out, Coach Larry, what was going on and why he was so excited about his great niece's book. Well, come to find out, 40 years ago, he wrote a book mm. for his daughter. And he took it to a publisher. And they told him nobody would read mm. or buy a children's book by a black man. So this book that my uncle wrote has been sitting in his closet all 40 years and he pulled it out for the first time when his oldest niece, that's me, wrote a book and brought it to him. Mm. And I thought, oh, my God, where could he be, Coach Larry? Where could he be? Because we all know self-publishing is expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, my kids got holes in their shoes right now because we got best selling books. Okay, I can't afford to pay all the bills mm -hmm. and publish best selling books because it's all coming out of my pocket, right? And we're making sacrifices for that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, nobody held his hand and navigated him through the process. And so he didn't think it was possible. So, coach, you talking about the mirrors? That's the mirror that he needed that he never got. And 40 some odd years later, here I come with a book that he could have put out 40 years ago. I could have had a book 20 years. Years ago, we could have two, three authors in our family, but we only have one, and that's me because we didn't know it was possible. Now, look, coach, look, 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 here come the mirror. Now, a couple months ago, I get a call from Judea Reynolds. Now, I'm gonna tell you who Judea Reynolds is, and everybody knows her. She's Darnella Frazier's niece. Mm. Darnella Frazier was only walking to the cup foods mm -hmm. to take Judea Reynolds there to get some candy because somebody gave her some money to buy a treat from the store. The only reason Donella Frazier was at the Cup Foods was because she was taking her little cousin there. That's how she captured the video of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Judea Reynolds' mama called me because I'm the only black author that she knows mm -hmm. or that she's seen who wrote a children's book. And we purposely, Segura, put our whole family, we put our whole family on the cover of both books, the husband, the mama and the children, because we need y'all to see we a family. Mm -hmm. We need y'all to see these kids got a mama and a daddy and we all yeah. look good and we all doing good and ain't nobody in jail and ain't nobody selling drugs and ain't nobody trying to overcome something. We fine. We got college degrees and we got good credit and we pay our bills on time and we just like y'all. Amen. Except we got three babies with autism. So Judea Reynolds' mama called me and we sat at the publisher for an afternoon while her and my daughter Cameron played and cranked out her book, My Walk to the Store. Wow. How to help kids heal from the tragedy of George Floyd. Now, has she not seen me? How's she going to process that, Sagira? How's she going to process that, coach? She got that book in her hand and said, mama, I want to write a book just like this book about Cameron. Well, who do I call? You know, coach, you talk about being in the community. You know I'm there. You know I'm there. Anybody, anytime somebody called me, I'm there. So I'm listed. I'm accessible. So they call me, and guess what? We show up, and that's what we have to do for the next generation of writers, for the Judea Reynolds out there, for the Donnella Frazier's. When they call, we have to show up. We have to be accessible. We can't write our book, get our accolades, get our awards, and turn our back on our people. We have to be there for them. And we need our allies to stand in the gap, step up, and be there for us while we support our community. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you talked about the story of your, was it your, your uncle Shaletta or was it mm -hmm. your, your uncle? uncle? Yeah. I, I put in the chat that I, as a black publisher, come across so many, especially our, our elders who feel so unworthy of their story being told because they were told in school. Um, was it Larry, what you said? They were told in school that you don't read, read well enough. You don't write well enough. You're not enough. And there's that that doubtfulness, that unworthiness that um, I sense oftentimes from black and brown authors. And um, when I was in the sixth grade, I'll never forget Miss Dillon, who had an assignment. It was a journal where we wrote to her back and forth. She said, write anything you want, class. You write it in your journal. You write a question. You write an idea, a thought, whatever you want. You give it to me and I'll write it back. And it was a language arts tool 
for the students to get comfortable with writing. Well, I love to write. I was reading at four years old. That was the one thing I knew that I was good at. And I'll never mm-hmm. forget, Miss Dillon said back to me, I'd written in my journal, dear Miss Dillon, I want to know how to become a writer. I'll mm-hmm. never forget, I can, I can recite it from, from memory at 41 years old. How do I become a writer? Miss Dillon, how much do writers make? That was my second question, <laughs> uh, right? How much do writers make? How do I do it? Can you help me do it? How do I do it? Miss Dillon wrote back to me, dear Dara, in the future, please write to me only about things that are really important, mm. period, cool. period. Mm. So when you talk about um, unworthiness, it's ingrained in us in all sorts of ways, through all sorts of messages, lack of representation, the ways in which we are spoken to by adults as little brown and black kids. And um, we actually have a question about how does one battle feeling doubtful in their abilities to being a productive voice? And that comes from Nikeshi Anunki. Mm. And I, I know I butchered your last name, Nikeshi, and I apologize, but it's such a wonderful question and I wanted to make sure we, we address that. So how does one battle feeling doubtful in their abilities to being a productive voice? I think, Part of it is finding your community as well, too, because um, I know that internalized imposter syndrome, that doubt, self-doubt, it's hard to like push back against all the things from dominant culture that tells us that we are less than. But if you have a strong core and that community can be your family, that community can be like your peer group of folks if you're uh, creating stuff together, but find your people. And then if you have that solid like home base, like to heck with everyone else, right? Because you're not, it's not for them. And I think that kind of boosts your own internalized self-esteem because you're getting that affirmation from that community home base. But I think if you have a solid community that you can build, even if that's just like one other person that is gonna be community to support you, I think that's really important. That's well, for, yeah, for me, I mean, this is, you know, one of the things that I tell my kids in, in terms of being a coach is this, is that first of all, you have to learn to be your biggest cheerleader. Mm. You have to learn to believe in you. And when you will learn, when you learn to believe in you, other people will begin to believe in you. I tell them it's like winning games. It's like winning games. When you win, people will want to get on the bandwagon. But I don't believe in you if you don't believe in yourself. And part of that belief system is this, right? We talked about, I just talked about, people will tell you, right, that you're not tall enough, Mm -hmm. that you're not fast enough, that you don't wear the right kind of clothes, your hair is the wrong kind of texture. But there's examples. And one of the things that I use with my young men all the time, imagine if Michael Jordan had listened to the naysayer or that high school coach that sent him home when he was in the 10th grade that told him he wasn't good enough to be a varsity player. You have to learn to believe in you. Mama become mama second, grandma second, Uncle Joe, you have to become your biggest cheerleader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. And, and let me just add this and then I'll go. And Whitney used to say, learning to love yourself mm-hmm. is the greatest love of all. So love yeah. yourself. I I ain't even got nothing to add on that. Coach and Segura uh, said that. I don't really have anything to say because this is the thing we have to do. We have to shake it off. We have to remember who our ancestors are. We have to remember where we came from and what we have overcome to get to where we are right now. And we have to look around and see, oh, my God, look at the opportunities. Look at the possibilities. And, you know, we got to believe in who we are and the gifts that God placed in us when we were born um, and, and use those to get to the place where we were designed to be. Um, and, 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 you know, to hell with what anybody else says or thinks and keep pushing and keep pressing. You know, the motto in my house is keep pressing. 
You know, when one person that. says no, keep pressing until you find somebody who says yes. And, and if that if people keep saying no, then you you build your own table and you build your mm -hmm. own chairs. And and like Sagira said, you find your network. And guess what? If you can't find nobody, it's just you and your God. It's just you and your peace. It's just you and your ideas. And you keep pressing forward with that until it comes to pass. It'll work if you work it. If you believe in yourself and you have confidence in what you are doing and you keep pressing, there is nothing and nobody, not even the lack of finances or a brick wall that can stop you. That's right. Larry, can I remind you of what you said when we first talked? Shaletta, you weren't there, but what you just said spoke to me. I have to repeat what Larry said last week, which was. If our kids really knew their ancestors were kings and queens, it would lead to radical change. I typed that so fast, Larry, and then I bolded it. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to bring that into the conversation because what you just said um, really spoke to me, Shaletta, about remember who our ancestors are. I That, that right there. And um, just to add to that, you know, that's where I've been really focusing my writing because I really do feel that there is an absence of books that tell the story of our ancestors. Yeah. Pre, pre, pre middle passage. I believe that our ancestors who were forced to this country beyond, you know, um, outside of their will and forced to be slaves, they were magical to be able to survive that so that we could be here on this panel. Those mm -hmm. of us who are descended from slaves, but yeah. we also have ancestors before that. And we have not, in my opinion, even begun to br break through to learn even a smidgen of who they were, the kings, the queens, um, the truth bearers, the, the folks that don't, they don't make it to the epics list of movies made and, you know, paid for by Netflix. And, you know, we need to have them in children's books. Exactly. You know, we, need exactly. to be, we need to be teaching our children uh, about these 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 amazing black and brown men and women who have uh, done amazing things. These kings and queens who were in Africa um, who came through those doors and got on those ships and were suddenly property um, and, and didn't lose their minds. I'm passing out because the microwave broke and these people went to, <laughs> from kings and queens. Um, you know, to, to be in slaves and, and still survived and still made it and still made a way for their family and adjusted and, and figured it out and, and worked the system and, you know, and escaped and, and then helped other people to get to freedom and, you know, and, and taught each other how to read and, and took care of, you know, the master's house and theirs and, and loved the master's children and theirs. And, you know, and, and we don't get those stories of uh, tragedy and, and triumph and, and love. You know, we get, uh, you know, the help. Mm -hmm. And we get, uh, you know, all the slave narratives. So, girl, don't laugh at them because you know I'm telling the truth, girl. Don't laugh at them. But we get the help, and they will, they will, they will give us all kind of Academy Awards and green light, all kind of screenplays about slavery um, and help. But when you start talking about um, black joy and celebrations and triumphs and friendships and and love and, and love. you know yeah. commitment and family and, you know, overcoming and, you know, accolades and, and celebrate. You don't get, you're not going to get that green lit. You can get that on YouTube. You know, you can get that at Penumbra. You can go to Penumbra and get that, but, but we're not, we're not going to get that in children's literature, which is where it needs to be. So we can break this cycle. You know where it is coming from you guys right now It's coming out of Nollywood. Follow mm -hmm. that. Nollywood yeah. is producing a lot of content and it's 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 soap operas, it's action movies, it's love stories, it's friendship stories. So again, going back to the source, it's coming. It's happening. The reckoning is here. And Sagira, mm -hmm. I interrupted you. What were you going to say? Oh, no, just ditto. Like, I think that go back to that original plan about investment. Like we have these stories. Right. And then also, too, I want to say, um, also, yes, the queens, queens, but also the, like the or ordinary folks in between as well who survived these things. Mm -hmm. like, like, I'm pretty sure I would have been a mediocre person like trying to survive these things. And like th that story, I think is part of it. And then also, I want to say like a part of this, like we are the ancestors for our generation, right? 
And so yeah. we owe it to that generation to that's create right. our stories. And also, I think that's why our, our imaginations are important to protect, especially when we're talking about encouraging this upcoming generation and ourselves even, or our, our, our parents or our, our grandparents or aunts and uncles when they're telling their stories. We're, we're the ancestors for someone. So we need yeah. to make sure that we're part, part, uh, protecting and nurturing our imagination and our future thinking and um, uh, everything that we're telling about ourselves and our stories and the stories that we're expanding upon from our past mm. because we're going to be the footprints that people, we're going to be that crumb that people re- reference. And so it's our That's duty, right. our future generations um, to create this stuff now, to support it and invest in it meaningfully. I yeah. love that. We have a question from Amelius White that I'm curious how you all will respond to this. Um, Amelius says, I have seen critiques of the notion of highlighting black excellence because the potential to cause some to feel that their achievements or aspirations are insufficient compared to some. So I believe what he, what, uh, he is saying is, how do we help black youth see the mirror without making, of, making people feel inadequate? So those who don't feel like they're excellent, how do we navigate that? How do you navigate talking about black excellence without alienating those who don't feel excellent? I hope I'm answering, I hope I'm so communicating I, 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 that right. I don't, I don't know if I understand the question, but, but I'll say this. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of sharing, sharing your movies, right? I mean, I, I tell my kids all the time, I'm a product of a teen mom. I grew up in the James E. Scott mm. project. You you know Coach McKenzie today, but you don't know my story. And so for me, it's about telling my story. I think I mean, and, and to me, when I mean that is black excellent, right? That is is telling the story of those who were successful when they when they were playing professional baseball, or Jack the Jackie mm-hmm. Robinsons, the Bill Russells, who couldn't stay in the hotels with with their teammates, mates, but yet they surpassed the achievements of those who had privilege. And so I'm saying it's it's all in how you look at black excellence. Right. But, but many of us, I can't speak for anybody else on here, but I was not born with a silver spoon, right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so I know the hustle. My, my dad worked three jobs all my life, all my life. So, so uh, you know, black excellence don't start at excellence. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, I, I just I just too resent the fact that, you know, that we have to dumb it down. Why do black people have to dumb it down? Why do we have to dumb down our achievement? Why do we have to dumb down our spirit of excellence? Why do we have to, you know, have a lower standard to make anybody else feel anything? You know, uh, you know, it's like it's like Sadiddy. You know, from the South, they say she's too uppity. Who does she think she is? You know, I only walk in rooms where I'm celebrated. I don't walk in rooms or spaces where I'm only tolerated. So if I walk into a room or I go to a space or I'm at a place and they only tolerate me, then I don't stay. I expect to be celebrated because, you know, I am black excellence. My children are black excellence. My circle is black excellence. And the people who are around me who are not excellent, I drag them to the finish line until we are excellent together. And so I, I hate when people say, well, you know, um, you know, what, you know, you just, you're being too excellent or you, you, you know, you, you're sucking all the spotlight out of the room and, you know, you're sucking all the fame out of the room and you just, your personality is too big. And can we just, can you just, you know, kind of tone it down a little bit? No. You don't ask any other group of people to tone it down. You don't ask any other group of people to stop being excellent. You know, it's like if if I'm blessed to have something or be somewhere or be in a position um, that I'm in and have these things, I'm not going to hide them. I'm not going to be embarrassed by them. And, you know, for so long, they have asked us to do that. They have asked us to not share our stories. I keep thinking about Katherine Johnson. Here is this amazing Sagiri. You already know where I'm going with this girl. Mm-hmm. Let me hold on. Let me. <laughs> I'm thinking about Katherine Johnson, the NASA astronaut who single handedly, with a group of intelligent black mathematicians and scientists, saved the space program. Nobody told her story for 50 years. Those white men 
sat there and knew of the accomplishments that she made, knew of how she saved that space station, let her do all that work, and they never gave her a certificate of appreciation. 50 years later, somebody in Hollywood green lights the script, and now we got hidden figures. Now we're just now finding out about Katherine Johnson. Mm -hmm. She had mm -hmm. one foot in the grave and the other one in a wheelchair before mm -hmm. anybody told her story. This is modern day America. It is what it was in 2019, and all these little black girls were dressing up as Katherine Johnson, and they were talking about black girls in STEM and the space program. And you got these black girls wanting to go and, and be astronauts and, and work at NASA. They could have done that 50 years ago in real time when it happened, but they didn't do it because somehow black excellence and black brilliance, when you are talking about African American, especially women, nobody wants to tell it or hear it. And they want to tell us, tone it down, wait, we'll shine a spotlight on you. You don't have to shine a spotlight on yourself. You brag too much. You talk about your accomplishments too much. You need to wait and let somebody know. Katherine Johnson did that and she waited 50 years and nobody told her story. They had to wheel her out on stage for a president to put a medal around her neck. They had to wheel her out to see her own movie 50 years after she saved the space station. Nobody said a thing about it and they want to celebrate her after she's damn near dead. That pissed me off. I never watched the movie. I never wanted to see the movie. I never let my kids see the movie. Why? Because I want them to know that in real time as they're doing excellent work and they are making their mark on this world and they are changing the face and the narrative of what is going on in these United States of America that they are to be celebrated immediately. I come into a room with my own spotlight. I don't wait for you to acknowledge me and I'm never going to do that. So if my black excellence offends you, you had better exit stage right because I'm going to shine a light. There's going to be some fireworks. There's going to be some smoke. Uh, and there may be some music playing when I strut out there, Sagara. Yes. Okay. I love that. And I, 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 I want to respond to this question too, because I have a hot take, which is a both yes. end response. Although I want to say like, yes to that story about Catherine. I, I cut a poem, a second poem that I was going to read earlier that's celebrating someone again, like you described, who no one ever talks about, Gladys West, who basically is a, a, a black woman who contributed to the creation of GPS. We're all here using GPS mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to find stuff when nobody ever knows that a black woman's research is directly responsible to, to that. But in terms of the question about black excellence, there's like two parts that I want to respond to. The first part is harsh, like kind of what you were talking about, Shaletta, like we haven't had, we haven't been celebrated. There's so many things that we need to be acknowledged for our excellence. There's so many stories, right? And also there was a survival thing a lot of times um, when we look at our history and our, and our community about you have to, there, there, there was no like safety net. You have to be excellent because that's how hard the racism in this country is, right? You have to uh, be excellent. But uh, I also love the stories and I love the idea of just like, can we just be our ordinary, mediocre, like all kinds of things? <laughs> like, why, why is it that like the mediocre white boy on like a TikTok of no shade, like can do all this stuff and like, get, you know what I mean? I'm just like, where, why can't we just be our awkward, ordinary selves, like whatever it is. And so I want to yeah. like separate all of that in between again, because it's just like, we can't all be excellent. Like I'm willing to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, like, our truth, our bring our truth to being truthful about all yeah. things that do themselves. And so I think um, if someone is internalizing, like I can't be excellent, maybe you're excellent in your own kind of way. And it's like maybe we can challenge this idea of like what excellence is. You know what I mean? And, and change That's that. Right. But at the same yeah. time, like, yes, we can be. We don't. We don't all have to like be whatever this idea, this manufactured idea of like what excellence is. Like maybe you're just dope at something, and you just have to find your your gift, and that's okay. That's, yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say, Sagira. I think that um, this is a panel about um, the black narrative, and I think that black narratives are so powerful because we make everything dope. I mean, your time. your your um, auntie's gumbo is black excellence. You know, the way in which um, our, our mamas could make a $2 outfit look amazing for church yeah. on Sunday with a hat, gloves, a, a shirt, a top, perfume and makeup. And it was all on a shoestring budget. That was excellence. And so the reframing of Black excellence is, for me, 
remembering what Larry said, remember who our ancestors are mm -hmm. and everything ordinary they did was excellent. From the food they made, from the music that they created from nothing. Um, when you even listen to uh, Negro spirituals, mm -hmm. you literally transcend to an alternate universe when that music was formed from pain and sorrow and despair. And they're actually singing and sounding joyful. So I think that that idea of black excellence is so powerful because um, ordinary people did extraordinary things through time. That's the black story in a nutshell. But you know, Coach, Coach Larry, uh, we, we always had to be, and, and we were taught this in my generation, twice as good. Always. You can't come into always. the situation and get that opportunity now. We can be ours together. We can be our normal, regular, old self, but guess what we're not going to get? We're not going to get that opportunity because they will give the average white male an opportunity that they will not give me. If I, I have the same I feel like yeah. part of our radical revolution is like, we need to push back on the idea that we have to like, uh, it's like respectability politics too. Like look how long we got to the point where we can actually have our natural hair and not, it, and it's still in some spaces be considered unprofessional in some corporate spaces. Like that has changed. That wasn't always the case. Like you have to go to an interview, straighten your hair. Like I remember like, <laughs> like so it's like, I think we should still like push back against that too. But yes, mm -hmm. to what you're saying. Um, I want to pop in to acknowledge um, Pat Eldridge's comment that you all are demonstrating your excellence tonight. Thank you, mm -hmm. Pat. Um, I also wanted to, to um, there was a beautiful question that I cannot wait to hear your answers. And this comes from Judith. Y'all are so positive and inspirational. Who inspires you today, right now? Can I be honest? So yeah. you inspire me. <laughs> Yeah, you inspire me too. You inspire me too. No cap. I'm so serious. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so in this moment, if I'm being my most authentic self, Shabata, you inspire me, especially the work that you do with your children and um, and how you like created power from what could have been a situation that um, took drain from your family and, and, and everything, but you created power from that and your children are also benefiting from that. So you inspire me. I'm just like amazed and mesmerized. Oh, uh, you know, we, we have a motto in our family. Happiness is a choice. Right. Mm. And I just believe God will take whatever misery you have and turn it into a ministry. And so, Coach Larry, when the doctor told me I didn't have one or two, but three kids with autism, I, I got me a, a, some some vodka and I crawled under the table, Coach, and I said, I'm just going to drink myself to death. I really did. I thought, why am I being punished? And God said, you are not being punished. I'm giving you a position and that position is mother. Now get on up and raise them kids. And that's what I did. And once my kids start getting better, coach, I start looking for ways to help other parents. And that's when I looked at these books there. I'm looking at what you're doing and how you publishing books and how the children on the cover of the books that you publishing, you know, don't look like what my kids are bringing home from school. And I think, Coach, if, if they're over there doing it, it's good doing it. Well, heck, I can do it, too. You know what I mean? And, and so mm -hmm. it's about really us inspiring each other, depending on where we are in our journey in life. Um, and, and, and just bringing it back around and, and, and working to, to do our best and be our most excellent self. And that's where that black excellence comes in, because when we doing our, our most excellent work, you know, I, I don't know Sagira's watching me when Darren's doing her most excellent work. She don't know I'm watching her when Coach Larry's over there <laughs> motivating them boys. He don't know I'm sitting there listening and taking notes. So I can come back and tell my son the same thing he just told his kids. You know what I mean? So at, at, at every point in our journey, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are all we got. But you know what? We all we need. That's right. That's right. You guys, can I ask another question? This is coming from Marquita Brown, who is my sister. You guys, who's oh. here watching us. So my sister teaches second grade in the D.C. area. She teaches at a Title I school, and she's one of the best educators I've ever come across. And yes, I am biased. Um, and she's asking that as an educator, I want to encourage students to demonstrate their Black excellence and shine. What are some things you wished your teachers would have done or said to help encourage you to shine? Mm. 
Mm. Coach, you going to say something? Because I, I see I, it. I guess I, I guess I was going to say for, for <laughs> me, you know, I mean, probably being the elder that's that's here tonight in this group, you know, I was blessed. I mean, uh, I, I went to school uh, with black kids and black teachers and you know, be before uh, all of the the. I mean, I I was in eighth grade before I went to integrated school, mm -hmm. and so again, I, I think the the biggest thing that I would say to 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 a parent, to an educator is we got to show our kids, uh, we got to show our kids people and things that look like them. And I'm just a firm believer that if you and, and, I, and I think I said this in our previous discussion. I survived being one of 125 African-American males on a campus of 5,000 because I knew my greatness. I was raised that way. And so when they went to talking crazy, I knew that I was descended of kings and queens, that in my blood was royalty. And I don't care what you say. I know what I am and I know who I am. And so I think, you know, for me, with my with, with my granddaughters, I have four granddaughters, and it's making sure that they have doll babies that look like them. It's telling the stories of the Oprah Winfrey's, right? And the Michelle Obamas and the Bishop Vastai McKenzie that happened to be my auntie. I mean, it, it, it's it's letting them, again, I'm a firm believer, Giving them mirrors. You don't have to look out the window and wish. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. can be this. And here's mm -hmm. the thing that I tell my boys, and I'll stop. No matter what your situation in life is this. Grandma used to say, there's nothing new under the sun. That's right. You ain't the first or the last. <laughs> You're not the first one on welfare. You won't be the last one. You ain't the first mm -hmm. kid that don't know your, your father, and you won't be the last one. So let's get serious about what you want to do and let's beat this thing mm. i'm writing that down get serious about what you want to do and beat this thing i have an amazing question from miss sophia young doll how can i help to amplify black and brown narratives in my own small community i feel like y'all have a lot of responses for that how can someone amplify black and brown narratives in their own small communities? Uh, pick up the books um, and right. you know, give them out as Christmas gifts. Give them out to your library. Uh, take them to the school and make sure they have them um, available for students in the classroom. Call the authors. See if you can you know, help set up um, you know, speaking engagements, virtual or in person. Have them come to the school and talk to the kids. You know, coach was talking about something. You know, I, I grew up in a school where I, you know, I had black teachers and they affirmed our blackness. And we learned about, you know, black heroes and, and, and people who did amazing things. So, you know, I, I knew about things in two, second and third grade that I have to teach my high school about now because he's only had one black teacher. And, you know, if all your educators and learners are um, white and you are black, and, and then you start thinking, well, maybe black people don't know anything because we don't have any black teachers. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it's up to us to uh, teach our kids the history. Um, and, and so, you know, until we start um, getting more black and brown men and women into the classroom to teach our kids, then, you know, it's up to us as parents and neighbors and friends of children um, to be that ally, to amplify those voices, to help tell those stories and, and to find those books um, and, and those authors and get them in front of these kids and in these classrooms so that they can't say, well, I didn't know that this book was available. I didn't know that this author was available to speak. Um, and it shouldn't just be for February. It shouldn't That's just right. be for, you know, for Black History Month. It should be, you know, if you got an author in the speaker series, if, if you've got books in the library, if it's Christmas time and they're looking for books and you're making a donation, you know, it should be, you know, 12 months out of the year 
um, so that these kids can have a Cameron Goes to School or Daniel Finds His Voice or the high school kids, you know, can, can have the books that are available to them so that they can be inspired and understand. Um, you know, it's about understanding and learning um, other people's culture. And if you see that there's not diversity, if you see that other voices are not being amplified and you really call yourself an ally, you have to take it upon yourself to do what is necessary to make sure that these voices and these stories are being heard and told. One thing that um, I've been doing as a creative person is looking at things around me that are so white centered. Packaging when I go through Target, greeting cards. To me, sometimes the word wife, husband, mother, father, son, daughter are oftentimes synonymous with white. If you Google mother, what are the images that will come up? And so when we talk about amplifying black and brown folk and, and making sure that everybody is part of a collective narrative, one thing we can simply do is notice in a story, in a book list, in a, in a, in a, uh, recommended list of books to read or movies to watch. If everything is white, we should all feel like that is not okay. Yeah. And it, it's not okay to walk into a room and there not be representation. It's not okay to walk down an aisle and see every package feature white people and not a single person of color anywhere. So if you are white and you are so used to seeing yourself that you don't notice <clears throat> the absence of black and brown, that is something for you to get real good about unlearning now. Start that today. Yeah. And, you know, my daughter had a, uh, a homework assignment coach uh, using emojis and the emojis were in the school computer. Right, Sagara? Right. And so, uh, you know, she had to get emojis to tell the story. Um, and so, you know, instead of it saying grandparent, she had to find the emoji of the grandparent. And instead of it saying brother, she had to find the emoji of the brother and put the emojis in the story instead of the words there. Uh, there were no black emojis. They had no black emojis for my daughter. And she, um, you know, she kept looking and scrolling down and scrolling down and the emojis were just not there. And so we did not complete the assignment. And we had to tell the teacher, you know, you, you know, and this is a school computer. So it's not like you can go online and mm -hmm. copy and paste. This is in, you know, the context of the, the school device in the, in the school app. So we can't transfer emojis over. We can't go and get it and, and copy and paste. Right. Because, you know, it's restricted on an elementary school computer device because we're doing virtual learning. And so we had to just let them know you have given an assignment to, you know, 50 or so kids in this grade level to, um, you know, identify family members and put the emoji of the family member into the blank. However, you have not given your black, brown, um, Asian and Latino students an opportunity to have anybody who looks like them. So we are going to pass on this assignment. We are not going to do it um, if you are not going to give us the proper tools to do it the right way. I want to jump in, and one of the things is, I mean, and you, you hear people talking about being allies, and to me, allies is those people that write out a check, mail it to somebody, and, and feel good. We need co-conspirators. We need that's people right. that's going to get in the fight with us, right? And so, to me, when when we're talking about what can you do in a small town, uh, you got Salida, uh, Seguir, myself. Invite somebody to your house and a coffee table and have us bring some books. And let's see how many of your neighbors come over, right? So that we can have some some real discussion. And then we, you know, and then when you think about, you know, I'm not a native of Minnesota, but when I think about Nellie Stone Johnson and Josie mm -hmm. Johnson and Dr. Richard Green and and, and, and all and Dr. Mahmoud El Khati and all the, mm -hmm. the, the great elders that are still here. And you mm -hmm. can't invite them to your neighborhood library to tell their story. I mean, and, and, and so to me now, and I'm just being real right now, like that's when I get hot that's because right. we start looking for excuses. Right? Yeah. Don't tell me, don't tell me, you know, ally, but you can't have me at your dinner table. I don't yeah. want allies. I want co-conspirators. Well, you said invite Larry. One thing Sagara mentioned um, in our pre-conversation was you need to pay us. And That's I right. think that 
I think we should make that clear that co-conspirators, <laughs> people who are willing to roll up those sleeves and get in there with us, they are also willing to pay us for the emotional labor of being at their table to ensure that they are expanding their unlearning that they have to do to be better citizens of this planet. So Gira, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because we have 10, we have five minutes and I want to make sure oh, we wow. talk about the, I want to make sure we talk about the pay thing, the money. Thing. Yeah. I mean, I also am like want to marinate on this question too, because I feel like, yes, you have to be a co-conspirator, but like and make an investment in bringing people over, but also like, what else are you going to risk? Like the example that you mentioned, Shaletta, about like, okay, having to like pause, like a co-conspirator would have been like, okay, like I'm going to use my white privilege in a situation I hear over her with Shaletta and their child was saying, and like, you know what, we're going to like create a program together or like adapt the whatever the <laughs> software was. And we're going to have these emojis, like uh, we're going to invest in that. Like that would be like, you know what I mean? So people need to do that more. You know, if you're having ASL, like examples of teaching ASL for, with the hands, a lot of times are white hands. It's like, maybe somebody needs to just have some black ones and some brown ones. And it's like, but somebody has to like put it on the line for that. Right. So we have to have more like, yes, invite people get have book clubs you know what I mean read our That's literature right. also and then do what you said too like um looking for the ways that things have been erased or absent in these narratives and different spaces that we take for granted even like we all know about the band-aid stuff with the complexion how that was became synonymous with uh, a particular skin tone when it's not reflective of, of diversity of skin tones so we have to have more allies challenging these things and willing to lose something willing to risk something and sometimes that's financial sometimes that's comfort sometimes it's going to be making your relative upset but that you have to be comfortable with that or your neighbor upset and then in terms of investments i would say you need to pay us more a lot of times people underestimate okay listen the cost of living <laughs> is not synonymous with the way that people are trying to pay people right a lot of times and so you have to think about okay if you're inviting black uh folks to come speak at your school you know, there's a lot of time and energy that goes into that. If you're trying to invite a Black uh, author to read their work, like, yes, bring the work here, but also pay them for fair. And so I think a lot of times where uh, people either don't pay us at all or they underinvest in us. And like, look about, think about long-term investments too. Like, how do you sustain or support? support of that person and their work throughout. And so, um, I don't know, other people can respond to because I was all over the place. I'm like a chipmunk. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. What you were saying is absolutely right on. Mm -hmm. um, I know for Black History Month, I have had to tell people, no, I'm not coming um, because you are not going to pay me um, anything. I've had, um, you know, major corporations who um, the most insulting thing was they said, well, you know, we, we will give you a ticket to the event, we will give you two tickets. So you're gonna yeah. give me a free ticket to the event where I'm speaking, <laughs> where you're charging people uh, $500 a ticket to hear me speak. Uh, you're gonna give me a free ticket. That's my pay to hear myself. I can hear myself speak at home and then I don't have to hire a babysitter and then I don't have to get dressed up and then I don't have to drive and pay for parking. You know, you want my knowledge, you want my expertise, you want my insight, but you don't want to make an investment um, in getting that. You want to get that for free. You want to get that, um, you know, without it costing you anything and anything, you know, worth having is worth paying for. And what I'm mm -hmm. saying is, you know, in these major corporations in town, it's an embarrassment of riches. The Fortune 500 companies that um, want us to do things for them um, on exposure. You know, I can't pay my mortgage on exposure. You know, I, I can't put gas in my car with exposure. Exposure is not going to feed my children. Y'all saw the pictures of my baby. They like to eat, especially that girl. She's just as chubby as she can be. OK, they're not <laughs> exposure is not going to, uh, 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 you know, pay for the raisin canes that they like to eat on Fridays. So, you know, these companies have money for diversity and inclusion um, experts. Uh, the, the whole department has been beefed up since George Floyd died. They, they have all these these events and, and you know, they want us to come and and give our knowledge and, you know, talk to their people and inspire and empower and educate them and pat us on the back and send us on our way. And, and those days are done. Yeah. You have to know the level, level too. Like if you from, if you're inviting an emerging, you know, coming up the speaker or writer, just because they're a student doesn't mean you can't, you, they should be able to do, or have to do their stuff for exposure or, um, you know, uh, pre because you are a prestigious organization or something like yeah. that. That's not mm -hmm. enough. So make sure that you're investing every level because everybody's creative work, everyone's uh, talents, it has value. It took time and money yeah. and energy to create 
um, to get there. So invest in that, support us. And not just, you know, during Black History Month, like you said, like throughout the year, <laughs> Black 24 seven, 365 days of the year. <laughs> Don't stop just because it's, you know, February, after February, so. Sagira, that was an excellent, I'm sorry, Larry. I, I know you have some things you want to say, but we are at time. Okay. And as a moderator, I have the terrible role of cutting us off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Sagira, you ended on a powerful note. Celebrate us 365 and invite and invest, as Larry said. Um, before we close, I also want to make sure we have enough time for the three of you to promote your stuff. Folks have been asking how to support Black narratives and support Black writers and Black folks. Um, the three of you um, are amazing creators, and I'd love to have each of you Tell us a little bit about how people can find you and then tell us about a current project you're working on that can be either purchased or shared or both with the networks that folks have that are here today. We don't have a whole lot of time, so I guess we should just make it as quick as possible. Um, do you wanna start us? Uh, who wants to start? Whoever wants to start. Something that you're working on that people can purchase and or share. I'll, I'll start because I have the shortest plug. Uh, I have a children's book coming out in January. It's actually an activity book. So it's people who were saying, oh, how do I start, you know, supporting Black uh, narratives? This is a way, like, you can work with your students to create a book club. It's called Get Involved in a Book Club. It's pre-ordered. Uh, you can pre-order it now at any of your local bookstores. It's with Capstone Press. And... Um, yeah, start a book club with your kids and maybe, you know, focus on like Black uh, folks and Black authors, especially Black women. <laughs> yeah, so I've got um, two books out, Cameron Goes to School and Daniel Finds His Voice. Um, you can purchase them everywhere, Amazon, um, Walmart.com, any of the local bookstores. They're in all the Kowalski's markets. Um, and um, so they're available there. And then also I have a podcasting platform, ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. Um, we have eight shows celebrating Black culture. Subscribe to the podcast. Um, and, you know, we have a, a production company there. Uh, where we're doing culturally competent commercials. So, you know, we've been fighting all week with Target and General Mills about supporting Black-owned media outlets. You know, is your company uh, investing in Black media? Um, and if they are not, then you need to let them know that we want their ad dollars, we want their commercial sponsorships, and we want their commitment to the community. Excellent. And my website is www.coachmckenzie.com. You can find information about my book, Basketball, so much more than just a game. We will be going to uh, pre-sale here very shortly with a new release of 365 Days of Hope. It's a motivational uh, and inspirational uh, book of my favorite quotes. So I do a, a uh, quote of the day uh, for my kids every single day. I also share them on my social media. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all of the above. So www.coachmckenzie.com. Amazing. Thank you, Sagira, Larry, and Shaletta for your time and for your amazing words. I concur with our amazing uh, guests that that this was inspiring and motivational. I loved every moment of it. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, have a wonderful evening. And um, yeah, this was amazing. This was amazing. Well, and, and Dara, I'd like to say thank you too, to you for being such a great moderator tonight. Um, Chaletta Segura, Coach Larry, thank you so much. Um, we just appreciate you and appreciate uh, you sharing your insights with our audience tonight. Um, this evening's program is sponsored by the libraries and the Friends of the Libraries. That if you're already a friend of the libraries, we're so grateful for your support. And if you're not yet a friend, please consider supporting the university libraries. You can find a link to the Friends on our um, on our library's news website. Um, our friends are awesome, continuum.umn.edu. And I hope you can join us for the next Friends Forum, A Feast of Words, Minnesota Transform Project on 
July, or excuse me, on January 27th, we'll host a virtual discussion with Tracy Deutsch and Gina Desai from the project along with their community partners. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, good night to you and thank you. <laughs>